and thanks very much for joining us. Well, thank you very much. I'm uh, delighted to be here to talk about what is still, after so many years, my favorite topic, um, my favorite topic of research, but also still a personal interest. So I, um, I will try and convert this, yes, to a proper slideshow. I hope it works. So just um, a few words about how um, I've organized this presentation. I've, I've tried not to make it too dry, too academic, too conceptual, which I think is my natural inclination. So I've tried to focus on sort of visual artifacts, which I wasn't able to integrate in the book, partly because it's so expensive and also because access has become a lot easier to a lot of the visual culture material related to this period of anarchist exile. So it's, it's really a talk. Uh, rather than a presentation and um, haven't written anything, I will mainly be talking from and around the various um, artifacts, which hopefully you can all see on the PowerPoint. So I will start by explaining the title, which is not from me. Uh, you might have found it in the sort of sensationalist discourses that surrounded academic discourses about this period of exile in the early 2000s when this uh, episode of French anarchist exile to London was resurrected in the post 9-11 period. Um, some sort of right-wing commentators and even historians use that sort of terminology, but this one actually is an extract from uh, a French daily, the Matin, a widely read national daily from uh, May 1893. You can see the French original on the slide, Cité Anarchiste, and I, I inserted the French original so you could get a sense of how contemporaries would have become aware of this French present of anarchists, of anarchists in London, which um, I will focus on today, and how important for contemporaries in France, in Britain, and globally, this idea of French anarchist communities uh, being based in London was. So you have the translation here, which I will not read. Um, I hope you can all see it. Sorry, I have my uh, my Zoom bar here. But um, I like it because it also summarizes very, very briefly how these French anarchists um, ended up in London. Um, that's a very um, simplifying, simplistic summary. But basically, in the 1880s, late 1880s, early 1890s, uh, the French anarchist movement underwent um, a terrorist phase to um, again say it in quite um, simple terms. Um, at the time, this was known as the era of propaganda by the deep. That was the phrase used to refer to this terrorist um, ideology and practice. And so a string of um, terrorist attacks, in particular dynamite explosions, happened in France and internationally leading to stringent repression, which I will talk about briefly, and driving a number of French anarchists to London, where they gathered mainly in Soho and Fitzrovia, um, and in particular around a number of streets, including Windmill Street, where the International Anarchist Club was based for a while, um, if we're relocating, that was the Autonomy Club, written here in its French. Um, Standing. And um, it was perceived at the time as a hotbed of, in, sorry, international propaganda. That's a typo, I apologize. So a hotbed of international propaganda, a sort of anarchist mecca where it was de rigueur to go on a pilgrimage. So this idea of London as the obligatory rallying point of French and international anarchists, but especially of the French anarchists present in London, was uh, very important at the time. So why London is um, the first point. Um, so I'll start with a brief summary of how, uh, first of all, the French anarchist movement emerged. Um, it, it took shape really in the um, late 1870s and throughout the 1880s, largely as a result of the industrial and socioeconomic conditions in France. This was a time of um, urbanization, industrialization, causing a great deal of internal migration, professional instability, a period of recession as well, all of which um, proved conducive to um, the radicalization of um, 
part of the French labor and political movements. And at the time, of course, we are in the post-French interna first international period, and you see some, um, some anarchist ideas being formulated in Switzerland, mainly um, Switzerland, where the first international was uh, remained um, based, one of, one of the outposts of first international in the early 18th 70s and then you have different movements and a, a split occurs with a clear and that's obviously the um the um debate between uh, Marx and Bakunin and their respective followers and that's how anarchism sort of takes shape throughout the 70s and starts ideas stop spreading in particular to neighboring France um, this is, again, a very simple overview. So there are different events. Obviously, Italy is another place with a great deal, receiving a great deal of um, influence from anarchist ideas. But France is um, receives these influences partly through border movements of periodicals and of individuals. It is also, as I've mentioned, a time of radicalization for the movement with the spread of the idea of propaganda by the deed. So there, there are a lot of writings around this idea of propaganda by the deed, which, um, which seems to have appeared, well, again, a lot of uh, academic debates, but we can say that it, it appears really in the late 70s onwards as this idea that um, anarchists ought to spread their ideas through every possible means, and um, this includes written propaganda, but also gestures of propaganda, uh, acts of, well, gradually acts being um, leaning towards political violence. And that's where the, uh, these ideas start appearing. In 8081, there is an International Social Revolutionary Congress um, in London, which is anarchist in all but name and which enshrines this idea of propaganda by the deed. The idea is now to start um, really pushing anarchist ideas, really spreading them using propaganda by the deed. But by that time, it's really the idea of political violence, which has come to prevail. I do not have the, well, the exact formulation at hand. I believe it's a formulation by the Italian anarchist Carlo Caffiero, who is one of the Swiss exile, um, which, starts being uh, printed in the anarchist press and spreading, but it is reinterpreted as a doctrine of political violence. And France, I must say, is especially susceptible to this idea of propaganda by the deed. And this is how, from the second half of the uh, 1880s, you see a string of political acts of political terrorism, political violence taking place in France, increasingly violent ones until the really highly publicized ones of the early um, 1890s. So with the attacks of um, uh, Ravachol in Paris is quite well known. This is connected with um, labor trouble in France with the emergence of May Day um, as a day of, um, uh, of protest, of labor protest with labor strikes and um, the, the um, attack caused by Ravachol is largely, first of all, in retaliation against the arrest of some activists who were demonstrating um, on May Day. And th there is a snowball effect that takes place of political um, violence leading to increased repression. Um, France is a notoriously harsh um, country of anti-anarchist repression. And um, this leads to a wave of exile, again, to say it quite simplistically, but the, um, th there is a daily harassment of anarchists in France from the 1880s onwards. This is heavily documented in the police archives in particular, which is probably the French police archives are probably the main source in writing the history of the movement in France. If you compare, say, with a country like Britain, where the sources are non-existent, probably because they've been destroyed, at least in part, um, but in France you have uh, boxes and boxes documenting the daily harassment of anarchists, even before the passing of three sets of 
incredibly repressive laws known as the wicked laws, um, les lois scélérates, passed in the in late 1893, early 1894, which effectively fully criminalized um, anarchism. And this is followed by a landmark trial known as the trial of the 30, where 30 really prominent individuals um, are indicted. And this is a complete hodgepodge of um, petty criminals and really prominent anarchists. And by then, what you have seen is a mass exodus of anarchists to um, London, which is far more tolerant of anarchists. The reason, the background for this is, of course, a long tradition of left-wing exile to Britain throughout the 19th century. There is left-wing exile, there is right-wing exile as well. I'm based in Surrey. Um, and um, Napoleon III actually um, lived for some time just down the road from me. There is, um, throughout the 19th century, starting, well, most people, I'm, I'm very uh, conscious here that uh, there is somebody in the audience who is a leading expert on the history of um, Britain as a country of exile. But many, um, many historians trace back this tradition of left exile to um, the 17th century and the um, Huguenot exile to Britain, um, this idea of Britain as a more tolerant place than France, which is heavily resurrected in um, the late 18th century with the French Revolution, where you see the monarchists in exile, and then throughout the 19th century, a succession of waves of um, as revolutions, revolutionaries and then counter-revolutionaries um, find a refuge in Britain. So in the late 70s, of course, the latest generation to have found refuge in Britain is that of the communards uh, who came droves, uh, large numbers following the brutal repression of the commune in um, 1871. And by then, in the late 1870s in London, you still have small circles of communards. And this, these are transition um, circles between this earlier generation and the anarchist generation who is starting to come in from different countries, from Germany um, in 18, um, 1880, you have the arrival of Johann Most, who then becomes a very prominent um, anarchist. He's coming from Germany following Bismarck's anti-socialist laws. And then the French anarchists actually start to arrive. And then um, groups from pretty much all over Europe. And then um, these groups keep on growing throughout the decades and um, in the early 1890s, where this um, period of exile actually peaks in numbers. After 1895, what we see is an amnesty, which is not directly addressed to anarchists, but which allows um, anarchists to go back to France. And from then on, you still have groups of French anarchists in London, but they are much quieter, they're far smaller. Um, they tend to scare populations a lot less than the previous generations of exile and the um, early 1890s wave. There's still some activity going on. Um, you have a small resurgence of anarchist exile during the um, First World War, but by then the internal enemy has shifted. So this is very much the end. So this explains the chronology of my book, which looks at the 1880 till um, 1914 period. So looking a bit more closely at the anarchist exile, um, you have the superstar of the anarchist circles here. That is Louise Michel. This is a poor quality photo, but I believe it is a photo of one of her um, London abodes. Again, uh, Martin Everett in the audience um, may um, concur or disagree, feel free to use the chat, but uh, I think this is one of the photos. So Michel is the most famous of all the anarchist exiles, probably, sorry, from a French perspective. She actually lived in London for two decades, whereas most of the French exiles went back to France as soon as they were able to spend maybe two or three years. But Michel was a true Anglophile for many reasons. And uh, this part of her life is not as well known. She, she didn't come, um, after the commune, of course, she was in New Caledonia at the time. She came um, in the early 1890s when repression in France became overbearing. 
But of course, Michelle is an exception in what is otherwise a community of unknowns. And the anarchists are very, very elusive. So um, and you question who has been identified, how many? Well, I'm, I think overall, looking at different sources, I have identified between 450 and 500 anarchists, French anarchists, or rather French speaking anarchists, because my study includes Belgian anarchists, but also a number of Italian anarchists who had spent quite a long time in France prior to this wave of repression, who spoke very often immaculate French, who were expelled from France and then relocated to London, but once in London remained in very close collaboration with the French circle. So this is obviously a very loosely defined group, a group with very um, blurred boundaries. Among these 450 to 500 anarchists, I would say that I have some solid knowledge about maybe 50 to 100 of them. 50, definitely, 100, this means that these are individuals whose name crop up across different reports, different sources, not just one police report where the name might have been made up, where it might be somebody who's identified as an anarchist, but in fact was just sort of walking by a club. So they are very difficult to identify, but I think there's a core of just over 50 where these individuals were definitely there and we have some sense of what they did in London. It doesn't mean that the 500 might just be a figment of the imagination of um, spies, but it just means that they are extremely elusive and uh, quite unknown individuals. So um, I've mentioned how they left France. Some of them left voluntarily, some uh, preempted a police arrest. A few um, dramatic um, cases include um, four individuals who were indicted in the trial of the 30, but who chose to escape before the actual trial, which might have been a bad idea because actually most of those indicted in the trial of the 30 were acquitted. But um, so this included typically with um, Emile Pouget, of whom I will say a few words very soon, Alexandre Cohen, Paul Reclus, who was the nephew of the famous anarchist geographer and theorist Elisée Reclus. Um, there's no uh, mass deportation, but there are waves of expulsions, especially of um, Italian anarchists. Different itineraries, often very secretive, um, using boats that tend to, they are keenly aware of police surveillance at the border. So um, use a number of routes, typically Le Havre en Fleur, um, going to Little Hampton was a popular, well, became a popular route to um, avoid the, the sort of more popular boat routes and thus escape police surveillance because detectives were in post in um, most of the main um, ports to try and identify anarchists. Rebuilding networks was uh, an important dimension of this exile. What I've seen is that, so if you take somebody like Michelle, she obviously knew a lot of people in France and she was already really plugged into international um, activist circles. So by the time she arrives in London, she knows many people. Her um, diary of address is actually available uh, from the time of London. It's available at the International Institute of Social History in Amsterdam. So that's an amazing source. And you can really see the people she met. So she really did meet a lot of people, typically Tom Mann, um, who um, is, is an interesting acquaintance from my perspective, because even though, of course, there were there was a lot of overlap between French and anarchist and syndicalist circles, it's not necessarily really intuitive, but many people also came to meet Michelle, many people were referred to her because she was so famously generous, so she used to be approached by a lot of people arriving in London, French people needing charity, wives of anarchists typically, but also non-anarchist individuals, so she does have these really um, wide networks, but many individuals obviously are far um, less well connected, but you still see them, it's quite clear in the archives, sort of clinging to and reproducing the earlier networks. So um, 
for instance, you see entire activist groups which were really um, active prior to leaving France being reconstituted in um, London. So um, the, the major one I found is a place called Le Cercle Anarchiste International, which used to be active in Paris in the early 1890s and which was actually not international at all. I think it was a statement, but actually the people attending it were all French and the circle is pretty much reconstituted in London. It doesn't rename itself, but you can see that all the individuals are there and that they all live really close to one another. So you do get a really clear sense of how these people got by and probably how they all ended up in London. There's something to do not with chain migration, but an element of chain exile and well, mutual aid, I suppose, in networks. Another interesting aspect is women who are so poorly documented, aside from Michelle, of course, her partner, Charlotte Vauvel, and just a handful of examples. So for instance, the journalist, Emile mean, Pouget is really well known. We know that his wife was there. She appears in archives, but most women are just very briefly mentioned in archives as la femme de, the wife of so-and-so. And evidence suggests, and I concur there with Pietro Di Paola, who's been mentioned before, who wrote a, a very similar book to mine on Italian anarchists in London in the same period, that it is a very real possibility that there were as many women um, in those anarchist circles as there were men, but their presence has simply not been recorded. So this gives a sense of how invisible they are, although they do appear in archives, for instance, um, in smuggling um, literature back to France when traveling to see relatives, or sometimes when, when there are mentions of social events in the anarchist press or um, in mainstream periodicals, you do see mentions of women there. Another um, prominent fact is the presence of journalists in these groups. So I mentioned Pouget, I mentioned again Malato, of course, Michelle herself wrote quite a lot. Um, there are other individuals who were active journalists or um, editors back in France who go to London, which is logical because of course, due to their journalistic activities, they were uh, targeted by the repression and therefore left for London. But this also explains the fact that this community is quite active and, and made a genuine political impact despite being actually quite a small community who only stayed in London for a relatively brief period of time. So I thought I'd try and tell elements of the story and give a clearer sense of the sociology by looking at um, key individuals. So I've mentioned, if you look at the bottom left, Paul Reclus, the son of, sorry, the nephew of uh, Elisée Reclus and part of this great anarchist dynasty. So uh, Reclus left uh, due to being indicted in the trial of the 30. Interestingly, he did not relocate to London. He went to Scotland, where he worked in a school for several years, but also worked with um, Patrick Giddes on his geographical works and continued his activity. He traveled under the alias Georges Guillou, and he'd, um, that was the name of a friend, which he'd borrowed. But it, it's a sort of Scottish outpost of this um, group of exile. Next to him, you have Emile Pouget, which is, um, well, a very well-known figure among anarchists who, well, may or may not be known outside. He went on to have a really um, important career as a lead, leading syndicalist organizer. He was the first secretary of the French um, CGT. But Pouget is uh, one of those, again, who leaves just before the trial of the 30, goes to London and sets up, relaunches, um, a London iteration of the paper that had got him into such trouble in France, and that's Le Père Pénard, to which I will go back. Le Père Pénard is the iconic uh, plebeian French anarchist newspaper, very vocal, very irate paper, and uh, Pouget relaunched it in London, where it produced eight magnificent issues. Top left, you have somebody who is really quite unknown, but who is a good example of those sort of 50-ish anarchists who have been identified, and that's Élisée Bastard, and he's quite interesting. He comes from the suburb of Saint-Denis, 
which is a, an industrial suburb of Paris, hotbed of anarchism, as the press would say. So he represents these, um, these um, individuals who turn to anarchism I think as part of this, um, the um, sense of isolation created by the second industrial revolution. But what is interesting about uh, Bastard is also that he is in exile with his entire family. Um, you do have the four members of the Bastard family, the dad, mum and two sons, and they all go into exile. So we talked about reconstituting um, exile networks. We talked about women, I think with the Bastard family, you have a good illustration of this, of how um, individuals moved, but also with sometimes with their entire community and they got into a lot of trouble in uh, London. There were also individuals who were really on the border between um, petty crime and smuggling activities and anarchism. Next to him, colorful figure, Charles Malato. So, um, somebody who embodies this um, Franco-Italian um, connection, even though Malato was multi multilingual, he spoke uh, fluent Italian, Spanish, English, um, French, of course, but he himself was actually, um, he, he was French, but his uh, father was um, Sicilian. And Malato is another journalist who goes who has edited a number of papers in Paris and then goes to um, London and relaunches his own paper anonymously, but this is another influential paper and a very colorful publication. And Malato actually then uh, wrote his memoir of his time in London. He published this when he was back in Paris, that's in 1897, and that's called Les Joyeusetés de l'Exil, The Delights of Exile. Um, and the subtitle is Chronicle of a French Exile in London. And it, it's, it's such a marvelous book. Of course, it's an incredible source for historians to get an insight of life within the community and how the community of French and international anarchists thought of themselves. But it, it's, it's written in such a funny way. There's a, there's a Franco-English sort of uh, mini dictionary at the time, he even prints the schedule of boat crossings to London, so we do really get the sense that crossing over to London, going into exile to London was very much a routine thing for a French anarchist at, at the end of the century. And that's, that's partly thanks to Malato. The cartoon, or the drawing, sorry, you probably uh, recognized, I believe, um, is Michel on the left, but I've actually included it because here we have Gustave Brochet, he is a wandering exile, an extraordinary figure um, who, um, who was active in um, communities in the US prior to coming to London, who ended up his, his life in Switzerland in the 1830s, a really long-term anarchist, which is actually quite rare because many of these individuals who take somebody like Bastard, he just has a, a sort of passing acquaintance with anarchism, but Brochet is a long-term um, exile and also somebody who arrives really early. Most of the individuals I've mentioned arrive in the 1890s, early 1890s, when things start really to heat up in Paris, but and in France. But Bourget is there from the uh, early 1880s, and he actually joins the Socialist League in this period where there's just a few French anarchists around, and some of them uh, join the Socialist League. He's instrumental in setting up um, the first French anarchist club. So um, an interesting figure who represents a slightly different chronology. Top right, um, some of you might recognize another highly colorful figure, Luigi Parmigiani, um, who is um, another embodiment of those Franco-Italian circles, but whereas Malato embodies a very erudite, very, um, he's also a theorist, a writer, doesn't dabble, in um, political violence, perhaps a little, a few coups here and there. Um, Parmigiani is just a crook. He is an art, um, he sells stolen art good, actually made a fortune doing this. He ended up having his own um, antique shop in London where Queen Victoria famously came. And um, he now 
is recognized as an art dealer in Italy. You can even uh, listen to podcasts on Parmigiani as a recognized figure in the art world. So he really worked his way up from these anarchist circles because in the early 1890s, he was well known as belonging to very incendiary, incendiary groups of um, anarchists, Franco-Italians, both in Saint-Denis, just outside Paris and in London, advocating political violence, publishing very violent material, of course, heavily suspected, probably with reason of being in the pay of the police. And I believe these individuals give you quite a sense of the different um, types, brands of anarchism, the sociology of the movement that you find in London. Bomb plots, as you can imagine, were integral to this, oh, sorry, to this period, and they, um, and they were heavily represented in the press. So, of course, the London um, outposts of anarchists, um, I'm focusing here on the French, but by the early 1890s, where there are communities from all over Europe, there's a very um, strong, very large um, Eastern European Jewish contingent as well, which is largely separate, but there is a, a really um, noticeable anarchist presence in London, which is of course felt much more vividly uh, and disproportionately to its actual numbers, but this is a moral panic closely connected with anarchism. So daily rumors abound, um, things like Le Matin, the, the cover we started with, this is a daily occurrence in every single French paper. I've looked at many provincial papers, you do have hundreds of thousands of entries about every fact happening in London. And this is very much an age of press virality. So something that does appear in the French press is likely to be replicated in the British press and to circulate globally. Um, I've done searches on this recently. This was not in the book, but I've been able to do it thanks to newspaper digitization. And you see uh, papers, for instance, across the British Empire reporting um, on rumored bomb plots in London uh, pretty much on a weekly basis. So um, a few famous incident, the Walsall bomb plot, which happens in 1892, um, as the name says, this is an international alleged bomb plot um, devised in, um, in Walsall in an anarchist club involving French and Italian anarchist and a French provocateur known as Auguste Coulon, and um, of course, we've since discovered that it was a bomb plot. It was strongly suspected at the time, but it's since been recognized as such. Then Greenwich, which I expect some of you will be familiar with, the famous um, Greenwich explosion, of which you have an illustration here at the top right. Um, this is Martial Bourdin, the French anarchist with many, many inverted commas, because his uh, links with anarchism were actually relatively tenuous, you have here a rare photo, bottom left of Marcel Bourdin wooing a lady. Um, the incident has been dramatized so, um, by Joseph Conrad in his novel, The Secret Agent, which also explains why it's so famous. But basically Bourdin in February um, 1894 exploded in Greenwich Park. He was killed by a bomb that he was carrying, uh, an accidental explosion. Um, the destination of the bomb remains a matter of speculations for um, historians and Conrad scholars um, to this day. But I think thanks to this, we do have a picture of Bourdin um, that has been dug out by a Conrad scholar. So it's quite striking. And this was followed by a very rare uh, visit of the police, the British police at the Autonomy Club, the haunt of the... Um, international anarchists in London. So you do have this image top left of um, Chief Inspector Melville, which was the bête noire of the um, anarchist, was in charge of anarchist surveillance at uh, the newly established special branch of the Metropolitan Police, that's uh, Scotland Yard, to um, keep an eye on anarchists, shall we say. So these, these are just very quick snapshots into this sort of history of suspected propaganda by the deed in London. I think that's the main point really that it, it remained. Um, of course, there was an, an explosion in the case of Greenwich, but it remained comparatively tame if, if we look at what was happening in other countries 
But of course, um, surveillance was very, very intense. So in the middle, you have a photo of uh, Chief Inspector Melville, William Melville, uh, which the anarchist, whom the anarchist, the French anarchist called Ville Melville, because he was really vicious, actually. And he's an interesting figure, because as I will uh, mention, there was this great idea that, the, the, that Britain was uniquely um, liberal in the way it welcomed and tolerated anarchists. And this is true comparatively to some extent, but there has been a great deal of historical oblivion, shall we say, or um, revision to hide the extent of police surveillance. I've mentioned the disappearing archives and clearly um, Melville and other um, political and police figures were heavily involved in um, well, political policing of the anarchists. And that's why I've, um, I've added to the slide um, the book, the recent book by Vlad Solomon, State Surveillance, which is really fantastic, which does such a great job of reversing this liberal narrative of um, the laissez-faire Britain, which was so sure of its sort of uh, institution that it could afford to host anarchists from all over the world. Because um, what Solomon really shows is the level and the closeness with which anarchists were indeed scrutinized and kept under close surveillance. So this is a really, um, really interesting way of looking at this period. And actually, you have an example here, which I found while researching my book on Jean Grave. So Jean Grave, uh, who was a leading French anarchist who did not go into exile, visiting Kropotkin and Malatesta, Enrico Malatesta, the Italian anarchist, who was also in London. This is, um, I believe, in the early 1890s, but it's basically a police report saying, oh, we, we, are, we know that uh, Grave is in London. He's come to visit Kropotkin and Malatesta. And I just, I find it absolutely extraordinary, of course, because these were really prominent activists to find a random police report mentioning these individuals um, and showing the level of surveillance. Um, because, uh, well, obviously they're, they've mentioned hundreds and hundreds of documents like this, but this one is about three highly um, visible people. But the anarchists did not just take it on the chin. I think there were lots of resistance strategies against this political surveillance. Um, of course, you can't quite counter the whole apparatus of surveillance because there were also French spies in London and Italian spies. Uh, they were really under scrutiny from many um, perspectives. But um, there were community building strategies, shall we say, and sometimes not just symbolical ones that um, allowed the anarchists to keep going. So I've mentioned how Pouget relaunched his London series of the Perpénard whilst in London. The first issue appeared in September um, 1894, I believe Pouget was by then settled in Islington. And if you can see my cursor, the first issue, which is not the one here, this one is the second issue, but it's a drawing in the, in the fine anarchist tradition of having a, an artist um, doing the uh, cover drawing. What it shows is obviously in the foreground, an official person, you can see the, the ribbon, so a police, politician, etc., looking very austere and officious, and behind him, two workers, anarchists, circulating an anarchist journal. And what it is, what it says on the cover is Il n'est pas mort. And that's the title of the first issue of the Perpénard in London. So what had happened is that Pouget, once in London, decided to relaunch his periodical, but in order to detract the attention of the police, and because they were keeping such a close eye on periodical and printed material, which was highly subversive, he changed the format, he changed the title, he did not say, this is called the Perpénard, and so the paper was able to circulate in thousands of copies. It was even advertised in France. I've seen posters at the International Institute uh, in Amsterdam advertising this London publication for French readers, so they were laughing right under the nose of the police. And the second issue is another jibe at the police saying, look, you missed it the first time we were able to circulate it. And now we're doing a whole cover to laugh at you, to show how we 
fooled you with our publication. So this is more something to do with, well, symbolical resistance as one well, resistance strategy in the face of police oppression. Another issue of the paper is called Judah, Judas, and it tells the story of how the anarchists unmasked a spy in their midst. You have his photo on the right, there's a long report, and they, um, they basically had an infiltrated agent from France who was not particularly good at his role and thus got himself um, exposed. It, it's quite interesting because you can follow his reports in the French police archives until the point where one day he sends a letter and he says, oh, I've been exposed in capital letters. So in French, je suis brûlé, I am burnt. And here you have the take of the anarchists on the story. So obviously it's a word of warning. It also tells of how you can uh, unmask spies. So this it, it's halfway between practical resistance and counter surveillance, and at the same time, symbolical sort of community building, humorous transgression, um, etc. However, uh, as you can imagine, this was not quite enough to uh, stem the tide of uh, repression leveled at the anarchists, and things took a very formal institutional turn from um, the end of the 1880s, when um, an anarchist, um, an, well, or rather an anti-anarchist um, um, conference was called in Rome. You have here the cover of um, Richard Bag Jensen's exemplary book on uh, the history of those international efforts to coordinate um, against the anarchist peril. It feels like such a cliche because I've said this so many times, and this is very much a Jensen's argument, but um, the international anti uh, measures against anarchist and um, the practical steps, the practical coordination that was put in place is the forerunner of Interpol. That's the claim that uh, the international fight against anarchism announced um, or, or created the foundations for Interpol. So here you have the cover of the French um, documents for the Conférence Internationale de Rome, which is a really interesting document because all the countries had very different ideas about what they were willing to share with other governments, what kind of information, intelligence, what kind of resources, how much they were willing to put in place to compromise on certain liberal principles. For instance, there's a really protracted discussion about deportation, the deportation of anarchists, and where the French were actually more um, liberal and progressive than many of their counterparts. As for the British, they did not even sign that protocol. They, um, they were still wedded to their self-representation as a very uh, liberal nation um, at the time. But I think they mainly had ulterior motives um, that basically they wanted to pretty much hide the extent of their own surveillance practice and also hide how they operated and also a sense of distrust towards continental polices, which they regarded as largely ineffective. However, things still changed in Britain. Um, there was, I think, largely uh, the economic context, a faltering phase in this liberalism, um, as the title of that famous book, The Strange Death of Liberal Britain, a sort of crisis of self-confidence. Mass migration from Eastern Europe, which I've mentioned, was perceived as um, a huge threat, economic, because it was um, allegedly bringing down wages, uh, creating pressure on housing. It was perceived as um, inducing racial degeneracy because they were um, Jewish. And so this propped up the argument of those who wanted um, restrictions on immigration and asylum. And after many attempts, uh, many of them, uh, many of many of which were based on these anarchist attacks throughout the 1890s. In the nine, in 1905, there's a law that makes it that is uh, voted, and that's the Aliens Act of 1905, which is a landmark law, the first one to restrict immigration into the country for 80 years. Again, some debate about the real um, practical um, impact of the um, Aliens Act, which is reinforced in 1911. In the meantime, there's also um, the siege of Sydney Street, which involves some Eastern, well, East End 
Latvian revolutionaries and creates another sort of anarchist stroke revolutionary scare in London. And that's uh, the time when uh, then young Home Secretary uh, first appears in the limelight. You'll see on the picture, that's of course uh, Winston Churchill. And again, you see, I think this is quite interesting because if you take all of this together, you actually see that the history of the anarchist, it, you know, you could say, oh, it's, it's just a story of exile of a few unknown individuals, but you see that it does have actually really considerable impact in changing um, traditions and in changing international relations. And that's obviously especially uh, visible in that sphere of alien legislation in Britain and internationally. And yet the reality of these groups were far more prosaic. It consisted largely of um, publishing papers and pamphlets. So of course, this could be quite incendiary, quite revolutionary. So here you have La Tribune Libre, which was largely uh, a spy uh, creation, really a uh, sort of um, provocateur, uh, but it's, it, well, there, it was not only a provocateur publication, and it was very incendiary, very pro-propaganda by the deed. So you can say, well, actually, it's not so prosaic, it's, but it was, you know, it was not necessarily going to lead to a terrorist attack. Lots of pamphlets. So the anarchists published five papers throughout this period, um, many pamphlets too, and these were published by the hundreds, the, the, the yeah, pamphlets or the placards in the thousands, they're difficult to get hold of, but that's really interesting material. Otherwise, the, uh, life, the lives of these groups were very much revolved around commemorations and celebrating the International Revolutionary Calendar. So of course, the 18th of March for the Commune, May Day, and then um, the, um, the anniversary of the execution of the Chicago anarchists in uh, November. So this is very much ritualized. You have large gatherings. So here an example with a public meeting, bidding farewell to Louise Michel and Pietro Cori in uh, 1896. You can't see it, the date, but they were going to go on a tour in, um, in the US and the tour got canceled. But it's interesting, you have the list of speakers at the bottom, which really gives you an idea of how vast uh, these circles and international these groups were. So you really have some um, pretty well-known names in these circles, so Sebastian Faure, leading French anarchist, Eric Omar Atesta, et cetera. Education was a very important aspect of the life of these communities. And you have the International Anarchist School set up by Louise Michel on Fitzroy Square. Uh, so Martin Everett is here, he really is the expert uh, and he's uh, dug out so much interesting material. I believe um, he and us, this prospectus for the school, which was drawn by um, Walter Crane. So Michel set up the school, which lasted for about a year before bombs were found in the basement. And these had been planted there by the infamous Coulon of Walsall fame. But um, it's actually, if you, if you look beyond this, it's really interesting because it reflects the anarchist commitment to education, which is actually a strand of this period. If we look beyond the emphasis or the public emphasis on terrorism, political violence, educationalism was far more important. And so was internationalism, which is present in all these initiatives. And lastly, syndicalism was very much um, does not designed, it was very much in discussion in London, the turn of anarchism towards um, syndicalism and the idea of infiltrating trade unions was very much a product of these discussions between international groups in London. So we mentioned Mann, of course, he was really important, but Pouget uh, observed this at first hand and so did Malato and the small papers were essential for us to disseminate these ideas. And this is why it's especially important to look at global press networks. I'm, I'm almost finished. I'll go through the last few minutes quite uh, quickly, but it's important to say really because there was so much moral panic, so much sensationalism surrounding these groups. It's really important to keep in mind the reality of what they did. Um, so here you have the UK-based subscribers of La Revolte, which was printed by Hav in Paris. And um, so we are looking at the dissemination of French material in London. Um, I'm happy to share the slides after, but it's really quite interesting because you do see, for instance, German readers, you see the Commonwealth, so, um, 
Morris's uh, publication, The Autonomy, uh, said that by your most being subscribers of this French periodical. So we're really looking at, um, what can I post? We're looking at um, important international networks from France to Britain. And then actually I see if this works. Uh, looking at, can you see my screen? Are we still on the uh, old chair? Hmm. Well, hopefully um, you can we can see global press networks too, but not the link, I think. Okay, so let me reshare very, um, da, 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 da. let me see very, very quickly. So that's actually a map. Sorry, I apologize. I know that uh, Google Maps are a very, very bad idea, but it's so much easier to do. So these are, I've, I've taken all the information about international spaces in the London Perpena, so that's eight issues, every single one, even if it's just one mention in passing, and I've put it on the map. So you do get the sense of where the paper had its network. So reaching all the way to, well, there you go, Argentina, Uruguay, Egypt, and they were spreading with each issue. So obviously Europe is very dense, the east coast of the US is really dense, but you're looking at a really tiny illegal publication and the fact that it was disseminated like this globally, it really shows you that this allowed these London circles to be a hub uh, and a laboratory for the elaboration of new political ideas and the dissemination. And actually, I've also, I hope we're back, we should be back on the slide. Uh, this is the reality on the ground, because it's easy to say, oh, well, you know, how did this happen? And um, I know this is not really legible. It's actually a screenshot from uh, a film about a documentary about anarchism. But the titles that this street vendor is uh, selling are very international. So presumably this is a French um, image he's selling all the French classics, but also some Dutch um, titles, some Italian ones, and freedom. So you see actually people were reading this material. Um, you know, he's clearly selling them um, random French alley. So there was this dissemination on the ground. And that's, I think, the core perhaps of London activism, really looking at this press activity, this exchange of idea and how the press related. Here, um, yes, we can look further away at the um, at the context, but again, if we, I was only able to focus uh, on the French groups here, but it goes much further afield. Um, mentioned press networks. I've mentioned uh, the mainstream press, which obviously get, gave added impact to these groups. There were also international visitors like Emma Goldman, who came to London quite famously in 1899. And this worked both ways, of course. Um, this integration in global networks, it built up the anti-anarchist moral panic, but it also built the um, global connections and communities of anarchism itself. Right, I am going to uh, conclude now. I, I wanted to stress that, um, really I've mentioned the, uh, the Mecca, and I think this is very much an historians and an activist uh, Mecca. This is very, I, I see my work as being really part of a far broader effort to map out the global anarchist diaspora in this period and beyond, I would say until uh, the Second World War. So I, I was, I wanted to share some work by no means works by no means exclusively by colleagues. I apologize that the names have been truncated. I, I really like that display. So uh, top left, you have BN Revolution by Tom Goyens, which is a study of the German speaking anarchist uh, movement in New York City, which is a really marvelous book. Then you have Nadine Willems' uh, study of uh, Ishikawa Senshiro, which is about, again, transnational anarchism and um, and Senshiro was a Japanese activist, but he was a really close friend of uh, Paul Roclu, whom I've mentioned. And uh, he, um, he spent a long time in Belgium and France. So really, I've, I know some of the facts and maps I've mentioned are quite Western centric, but there was genuine um, penetration of these ideas in Asia and the other way around, of course, ideas from all over the world were imported in the British movement, in the French movement, so this really global circulation. 
Number three is Pietro di Paola's book, uh, The Knights Errant of Anarchy, London and the Italian Anarchist Diaspora. Fantastic book. And then uh, lastly, this is by, um, sorry, I do apologize because it's not really very visible, but this is by uh, Ole Berklansen, who is um, on this call, I believe. And this is uh, a collection of essays by uh, an Indian anarchist and anti-colonial activist called um, Acharya. And uh, Ole is actually about to publish a biography of uh, Acharya as well. And this is, again, another sort of branch, I would say, of the same movement, these studying these global circulation, these exchanges of ideas. And of course, um, these ideas were very mobile, evolved, and th th there is, you know, anarchism is a very fluid doctrine, but that's really how I see the work, studying mobilities and studying the mobilities of ideas as well. And I do mention the activist Mecca as well. And I think, um, as you can imagine, this period of um, anarchist activity has really attracted a great deal of interest and partisan interpretations in both directions because, of course, of anarchism itself as a revolutionary doctrine, of the connection with the topic of border closure, um, in connection with suspected terrorist activities. I personally prefer to see it as part of um, the history of exile and refuge, um, where the movement is definitely towards border closure. And lastly, you do have a strand that studies um, this period of anarchist activity as a forerunner of the contemporary auto-globalization movement, but there's no time to go into this, so I'll stop just now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Thomas. That was absolutely brilliant. And it's great to see all the images that you couldn't get in the book. If only publishers would include images, uh, it would make our books much, much better, especially on subjects like this. Um, so uh, lots of time for questions. Um, so uh, if people can basically use the uh, hand up under reactions, or if they don't know how to do that, to wave and I will try and catch them. Um, so who wants to go first? Right, Steve Cushion first. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm interested in the fact that you use police reports, and I wonder how you assess their accuracy, because I'm thinking of the current sort of scandal about what we call the spy cops here, where uh, there were as back in the sort of 80s and 90s, probably still going on today, but back in the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of police infiltration of uh, rather small revolutionary groups. Uh, and we know now that it's all coming out that the police involved exaggerated enormously what was going on uh, in order to... Uh, uh, keep their jobs basically which was a very cushy number of uh, with an expense account uh i mean they 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 did that round here where i live in in walthamstow and uh uh as someone said well we we should have guessed they were coppers because they always bought their round in the pub but uh so i just wonder how uh you assess uh, whether the whether the police reports are have any truth in them or are just exaggerating in order to uh, uh, keep their uh, their cushy little jobs. Thank you. Yes, that's a very good question. Um, yes, there are different ways and it's, uh, it's a little uncertain. I think generally speaking, since writing the books of 10 years ago, I've tended to revise a bit what I wrote because I think I was probably a bit dismissive actually of the information. I think you have to look at, first of all, for very grand prose, you do get a sense of when the writing is really uh, inflated. For instance, when there are triple negatives in one sentence, you know, we believe that this anarchist is not an active at the moment or inactive. You do, you know, you do get a lot of sort of padding. Then you have to reconcile with the history that you know. See, well, actually, did something happen? What do we know about this individual? So it's a good old sort of crossing uh, of sources. And then there's quite a lot of contemporary 
sources or individuals who wrote about this, so um, police, um, some, some prominent detectives in both France and Britain, then you also have some anarchists. So for instance, about Walsall, you do have several reports from anarchists untangling some police conspiracy. So you, you do have quite a lot of material that can help you find your way through. But for instance, when you do have week after week a new conspiracy being brought forward, I, I tended to dismiss them. And sometimes you do realize, oh, actually, maybe they were manufacturing bombs, actually. OK, thanks. Uh, Sam Foster is next. Yes, thank you very much for that very interesting talk. Um, I was just wondering if, um, in your research, if the uh, and thinking about this in a more international perspective, if the 1904 Entente Cordiale and the general improving of Anglo-French relations, specifically in relation to their hostility towards Imperial Germany, had any impact on this um, on these anarchist networks? That's a very good question. Actually, I, I, I did my uh, PhD around that time, around the century of the Entente Cordiale, which was a massive. Um, spur for the study of uh, Anglo-French exchanges and networks. So I really looked, I tried at the time to reconcile the history of these anarchist groups with um, the Entente Cordiale. It's on the ground, I think there's nothing. There is nothing, the, these anarchist circles seem to be quite immune to sort of uh, high politics um, in that sense. I think for the, for the powers, the international powers, you do see a bit of movement and obviously a broader realignment against Germany. But again, it doesn't, there's nothing that seems directly relevant. I think you can look at sort of broader climate and sort of uh, shifts, but um, it, it's not a landmark event. Okay, John Clemo. Yes, hello, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering how we can, um, how we can, is there any connectivity between these kind of knights errant as has been described? I mean, I'm thinking that, that is there any, any unity amongst them? Is, is, it, is there a, a connection that is organizational? Is there a connection that is ideological? I mean, if they are, they, 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 we, we have this group of individuals then who find themselves predominantly in London, um, I'm guessing they're not making direct connection with uh, with the working classes in, in 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 the UK, right? So I'm thinking, how, how do we how do we deal with this? Is this is this some sort of like socialist utopian dream, or is this is this the rolling up the sleeves and actually getting involved in politics? So is this about connecting with the proletariat, or are we talking about some professional anarchists, right? Who are living the dream? You know, it's on their passport when they arrive here. So I'm a little bit. I, I don't really sort of. I'm trying to work out that there is connectivity, but at the same time, you know, ironically, they're deracinated, aren't they? They're uprooted. So, so how does this actually play out, and how does this forward either anarchism or some kind of um, some kind of social reality? Well, thank you. That's a fantastic question and, and perfect plug for me because I've, I've got an article uh, which I co-wrote with Pietro Di Paola on exactly this topic coming out imminently. So uh, that's see, that's very much a question that did need to be asked. I think one aspect I, I didn't really discuss um, tonight, but there was definitely some. Um, I, I mentioned London as an ideological laboratory and the. Um, the development of syndicalist ideas, which did materials materialize in a trade union organization, in grassroots protest movement, which was really, which were really important until the First World War. This was partly a product of this London exile. So Franco Italian and British, in particular, so met at the Autonomy Club. There was no formal organization, but they met at the Autonomy Club in private houses, so Bouget had an Italian flatmate, for instance, they also met at those commemorative events, and there was an important um, Franco-Italian-British paper called The Torch, which was an important place where these ideas were discussed, printed, and circulated further afield. So I think from the sort of small local networks, 
involving perhaps just a handful of individuals, but being relayed, you did have this movement that really spread internationally. And these are quite well documented how French syndicate, well, sorry, international syndicalist ideas were reinterpreted in the US, in Britain, and did have genuine impact in the sort of revolutionary syndicalist movement before the First World War, and sometimes even beyond. So there was connectivity. The Italians were much better than the French at reaching out to the Italian workers in London. But those groups, the exile takes place against the backdrop of labor migration from France, from Italy. And the French were a completely separate group. They thought of themselves as exiles. I think you might say professional revolutionaries leaving, living the dream. They did not really attempt to connect with the workers, let alone organize them, let alone bring them to the anarchist clubs. But the Italians really, really reached out. They tried to organize workers. Um, they had more uh, labor-oriented publication. They tried to form trade unions. This might have been the influence of Malatesta. And, um, others. So that's a significant difference between the two groups. But you're right, the, these questions are absolutely central if you want to have a sort of political interpretation. And then, you know, and there were a few professional sort of uh, our case too. But the, uh, the, the serious politics and industrial action was there. Okay, uh, Francis King, you're next. Yeah, this, this, this really follows on from, from, from John's question, really. It's how the behaviour of the anarchist immigration compares with the uh, behaviour of the socialist immigration mm. that was in Britain at the same time. Because I, from what you say, I very much get the impression that the socialist immigration was far keener to get involved in the local labour movement. Mm. You know, lots of the Russians who came over joined the SDF and that sort of thing became involved in the British labour movement to concern themselves with, you know, with, with local questions. And the impression I get from what you said about the anarchists is that they seem either less willing to do that or possibly less able to do that because the labour movement itself was less uh, receptive or amenable to their ideas. So I mean, have, you, have you done anything on comparing those two uh, uh, exile experiences? Yes, I think, I think that's a fair point, but so I've seen a question in the chat saying, or uh, someone I guess mentioned joined the Socialist League in the 80s, and they did, and we know because their cards can be found, their membership cards, again, it's all in Amsterdam, you can see in reports, and it was presented as an internationalist gesture. So the question of internationalism and whether it was put into practice is um, central, it's the core of this, so most anarchists live sort of day by day in the hope of going back to France, it was a short-lived exile. I think you know, the whole question of the language has to be reckoned with. You're not talking about multilingual activists except for a handful of them. So what we do see is a very um, internationalist elite, particularly people like Michelle, who made much of the fact that she started learning English and some, some individuals really um, joined organizations, or actually, I say, wrote with um, in international papers. So th there was very much this collaboration or those collaborations at the top. And it, it did foster some international solidarities as well through, say, commemorations, which I've mentioned, uh, reading the printed material. So it's a bit problematic, I think, due to material circumstances as well. But I, I don't think there was, some people have asked the question, and something that is in this article um, that I mentioned that I'm about to publish about, can we say that the anarchists were actually nationalists in their practices? And I think the answer is no. I think they were genuinely sort of committed to internationalism, but it, it's, it is problematic. It definitely wasn't as straightforward as they painted it themselves. Thanks. David Morgan, you're next. You need to unmute, yeah. Yes, I'm just doing that. It does take a while. Your hands are arthritic and old like okay. I am. Anyway, fa no, uh, fascinating detail on the uh, social composition of anarchists. I, uh, I would like to ask if you can uh, say a bit more about the professions of anarchists. You mentioned journalists. I think you mentioned teachers as well. Uh, can you mention any any labourers who were anarchists? 
and uh, also the question of the social program personal relations uh, policy of anarchism maybe that was uh, something that the working class found difficult uh, to accept uh, because of this free love kind of idea was that was that prominent among anarchism to an extent that uh, might have been uh, something that put people workers off getting involved in anarchism thank you yeah thank and, you uh, that's yes yeah, carry on, carry on. I was going to ask about the women. You said 50% of anarchists were women. How do you, I mean, you've got the data. Why didn't they write anything? Were they all illiterate? Were they not able to write? Were, were they not, did they not think writing was important? Because we do have a lot of information about socialist women uh, of this period and intellectual women uh, who were socialists. Uh, why don't we have so many who, who are anarchists? Anyway, okay, was, David. I'll <laughs> leave, you, leave it to you now. No, but if we start with the women, I think the first step is that they were not recorded by the police. So if that's the primary source and they didn't feature in the papers as well, they might have written, but well, some, some of them wrote, but in the London groups, they're far less visible, um, maybe they were invisibilized, but it's also by comparing with other groups. So for instance, some academics have done research on Italian women in the US, and that's when you compare and you think, oh, yes, of course, you know, we can't look at that, but it's likely that the women were there, they were in the clubs, or that their way of being politically active were perceived as non political. So, for instance, organizing meetings or even, even cooking, you know, that's regarded as non political. But if you're, if you're running a political gathering and you're doing well, the, the cooking the organization then you know it is a political activity so there is that's where we start that they there's no trace because of the lack of record of recording which is due to the masculine outlook of the spies to begin with then a uh, profession yes yeah, sorry laborers formed um the bulk of the um of the exiled groups of the classic anarchist profession, so shoemakers, uh, the classic revolutionary professions, carpenters, um, you do have electricians, you have hairdressers, you have, um, let me see, you have um, cooks, chefs, um, you have all sorts of, you know, those the sort of um, artisan jobs skilled, semi-skilled, most of them. And of course, before leaving, most of them would already have several um, jobs at the same time. So yes, of course, laborers are well represented. And in terms of yes, free love, it's not really present in that strand of the movement. And that's one of the paradoxes that's more typical of uh, individualist anarchism and it mm -hmm. happens later. And actually there's quite a, a sort of important British strand, the sort of whole anarchist communes and sort of, uh, strength was far more prominent than it was in those anarchist communist circles but there were there were anti-marriage but in practice that's that's again one of the paradoxes if you look at the lists the inventories of those anarchists done by the police more than half of them were married and presumably their wives came with them so i think anarchists were very contradictory when it came to women and that's very much um reflected in mm. what we can see about women. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank okay. you. Um, Martin Everett, um, there are some uh, questions coming in through the chat, but we'll pick those up after I've taken the next four who've got their hands up online. Martin. Yes, uh, well, I just wanted to sort of pick up on a couple of other points that have come out of the questions so far. Um, one, of, one of which is about anarchist involvement in uh, so working class organization and so on. And that was very, very pronounced, uh, particularly in the East End of London, where groups of um, British and uh, workers of, other, of various nationalities, including French, were um, heavily involved in the organization of what's what was known as the new unions from the sort of uh, just before the match girls strike onwards. And um, the, uh, French anarchists were certainly very heavily involved in the Socialist League and were uh, involved in street speaking um, as much as the English ones were. I think partly there may be less of um, written about the involvement of French anarchists in this because the French anarchist community was so much bigger 
and tended to be located further away from the East End. Um, and whereas uh, the German and Jewish anarchists, for example, were all resident in and around the East End. So what was happening there was part of their everyday life. They didn't have to make any separate um, effort to go to a different part of London in the way that the French anarchists might have done. And also the size of the French anarchist movement, probably, uh, and the fact that they were so very close to France with people visiting backwards and forwards all the time, I think that meant that the, the, the French anarchists were much more involved with what was happening in France and French, uh, the French situation, the French anarchist movement than, uh, than here in this country. Uh, and one of the things that interests me is actually that Louise Michel um, seems to have been one of the very few people who um, seem to be very, very involved with the British anarchist movement. And... Um, you know, the people who uh, are amongst the teachers uh, at her school uh, in the second wave of teachers in th that were there was a whole stream of um, Fabian anarchist women mm -hmm. who provided the whole backbone for running the school at the same time as producing the anarchist newspaper Freedom. And here you have um, you, you have a, um, a situation where you've got a um, uh, the British anarchist movement being very heavily um, uh, uh, sort of underpinned by very active uh, women sort of who are producing the papers, um, teaching in the anarchist, an anarchist school, uh, but also in the East End of London, you had them working with the laundresses, setting up a laundresses co-op. Um, trying to set up a laundresses trade union involved with other um, new trade union activity in the East End. And so I think what you've got is you've got a very, very mixed sort of um, picture, which is very difficult to disentangle, particularly given the, uh, uh, the lack of a lot of, uh, a lot of resources um, that exists for some of the other political movements that were involved. But certainly when you go through the page, page by page through Commonweal, you can see a lot of involvement by French anarchists in, in the British uh, labor movement and British anarchist movement generally. Okay, thanks, Martin. Did you have any comments on that, Constance? It was more information than the question. Yeah, I think, I think that's a very fair, a fair point. Sorry, I should have mentioned, of course, um, in the East End, um, organized um, Jewish trade union that was a very important movement and of course there is activity as well in the trade union movement but I think within their own community I think that's the uh, that's what I focused on I think the Italians were probably better at organizing but they, they there was definitely a lot more involvement from the anarchists that we know in um in the labor movement, in the British labor movement, around the time of the um, DACA strike. I noticed somebody's put in the chat that that wasn't a question, but I'm happy to take information from contributors, which is relevant. You don't have to make questions. Um, I had Herbert Weiner next, but Herbert has put his hand down and gone on mute. So I assume you no longer want to speak. Um, I'll come back to you if you put your hand up. Uh, Andrew Whitehead next. Hi, Constance. Thanks very much for your presentation. Um, I want to return to the notion of London as an anarchist mecca, or perhaps you'd better say a, a haven for anarchists from the European continent. Um, uh, there were certainly uh, agents provocateurs active in the UK. The, broadly, they weren't working for the British authorities, they were working for uh, paymasters overseas. Propaganda by the deed in the 1890s did not lead to panicky legislation in Britain, as it did in virtually every other uh, European nation. The Aliens Act of 1905 was not, uh, in essence, an anti-anarchist measure. The, the debate about it didn't particularly reflect on the politics of East European migrants in the East End. The Houndsditch and Sydney Street violence, which did involve Latvian anarchists, didn't lead to another Aliens Act. Uh, a, a bill was uh, introduced in Parliament to tighten immigration legislation, but it never got through Parliament. It was quietly dropped. The court action didn't lead to any enduring conviction. 
um, uh, it, there wasn't again a panicked response. The liberal approach to asylum, which included asylum for anarchists, persisted until the First World War when there was a very dramatic change. So you can see why many European anarchists would have regarded London as a really good option. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Any comments, Constance? No, very true. Absolutely very true. I think, you know, there's there's some minor revision, the, the sort of, for instance, the, the cynicism involved in doing this and also the restriction is pressure that there was a minority, a vocal minority, um, who were intent on mobilizing the anarchist more panic to get new laws passed. But I think you're you're right, it was very much an exception to um, in this climate, and you can very much see why it appealed. Okay, uh, Thomas Jones is next, and then we'll take the questions in the chat. Thomas. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Constance. That was, that was really great. Um, I wonder if I can ask you a little bit about what happened after 1914. Um, I, I uh, really enjoyed the part of your paper about resistance strategies. And I wondered if you're aware of any strategies that the movement in, in London undertook during the war to keep in contact with the rest of the movement in, in the rest of the world. It's a very international and internationalist movement, as you very articulately pointed out. Um, and this is a period, of course, from 1914, where movement gets very difficult. Physical movement gets very difficult. It gets difficult to move information as well. Um, so are you aware of any uh, kind of that sort of resistance strategy to try to keep the links of this movement unbroken? No, that's a, that's a very good question. I'm not aware of anything and I've looked a fair amount and I'm not the, um, the only one. Somebody contacted me, said they were doing a project about London exile, well, sort of French exiles to London, a new wave of anti-militarist resistance and they didn't find anything there's no archives in the press there's so much censorship and of course the yeah. press is all about divisions yeah, with yeah. the manifesto of the 16 the making of the manifesto of the 16th when i was researching my graf book obviously graf was in britain in this period with his wife and i thought i'd find material there he was really isolated he was on the margins of the movement but even then i think he tried to mobilize people into a sort of anti-war movement but nobody replied that the picture you get is really one of brutal interruption yeah. um, and correspondence i've seen letters from a kropotkin well you see kropotkin is saying well just you know just stop sort of uh take up the weapons yeah. and you know <laughs> go to the front and things i like, no, i don't think there's much i think you'd have to be it's far more likely to be found in the italian press would be my guess ah. Okay, but Thank thanks, Constance. Right, we'll now pick up the questions from chat that we haven't covered yet. So we had a, a question from Graham Seaman. Uh, how many real believers in propaganda of the deed were actually police spies? Uh, E.G. Coulon, running chemistry classes, gives appearance of a larger movement that may be just him and a few others. Any comment on that, Constance? Yes, it's difficult. Of course, these provocateurs um, made a lot of noise and it, it's difficult. There are still a few individuals where it's not quite sure whether they were provocateurs or just you know, very uh, excited individuals, as the police reports would say. Um, and it's also fluid because for some time, even quite serious activists, um, like say Malato, might have been advocates of propaganda by the deed or just saying, well, actually, now we, we need to use violence. So it's it's really fluid, but definitely, and it takes us back to the first question about how you disentangle the spy reports from what was actually happening. Um, there's definitely a lot of noise that is created by the provocateurs and, and that sort of really taints a more peaceable community. Okay, um, there was a point by question from Michael Wicks, which you've partly covered, I think, but I don't know whether you want to say anything more about what came out of the involvement of French anarchists in the Socialist League. Um, I mean, I'm interested in this. I mean, in a sense, if you compare it with uh, the French Republicans and maybe later Republicans who had quite strong links with 
labor movement organizations. Um, it does seem that the, you know, even with Louise Michel, that her links were mainly into British anarchists rather than into the wider socialist movement. I mean, Tom Mann seems to be the only person who seems to have spoken at one of their meetings. So I'm just wondering if you could say more about both links into the Socialist League or the Social Democratic Federation or even the early Independent Labour Party. Yes, no, there, there were strong links with others. So John Turner, Frank mm -hmm. Kitts, yeah. all these early activists from the club lens circle. So obviously nobody joined the SDF as far as I know, yeah. but uh, in the league, it was quite important. Those strong links, we see um, those who joined. So the brother of Marcel Bourdin, who, um, who died in Greenwich, his brother was a Socialist League member, oh. um, Brochet, who's uh, drawing yeah. shown, and Coulon, I think, and Fred Charles, actually, of Walsall yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Batola was uh, some of them, as, as somebody mentions uh, down chat about the, the Walsall case being connected. So I think the legacy was really multifaceted. It helped foster a precedent for collaboration, internationalist gatherings, so quite symbolical, but these symbolical occasions were really important in building solidarity. Um, it did create those links that do reappear. So like, yeah, Turner or, um, Sorry, I'm looking for another name that will not come back to me, who went to the US in the uh, 90s as well, Mowbray, were mm -hmm. all um, important. So there are links, you're always talking, from my perspective, of course, you have larger movements, which we've discussed, and attempts at organizations, large gatherings, papers, but very often it's about two individuals, five individuals who know each other, and it's actually, they can actually achieve quite a lot. And I think with, for instance, with the connection with Turner, you see that, again, Tom Mann, the, the, the sort of few anarchists who knew Tom Mann went such a long way um, in creating all these syndicalist ideas and organizations. So um, I would say that that's how I think about the legacy of this French participation in the Socialist League. It's lots of different things that actually accumulate into different forms of activism. Okay, I think that picks up the points in the chat, including those from Graham Seaman, which is well, also on the social. Is it appropriate league. for me to comment? Yes, okay, Herbert. I wasn't sure whether you wanted to okay. jump back, but it's your turn. Yeah. yeah, well, I noticed that there are some historical facts that I hope they're not tangential to your presentation. Like, for instance, uh, the anarchists were very uh, active in the international workers of the world. And that was a very strong movement in the United States. Now, significantly, many of them joined the Communist Party at the, um, at the end of the Second World War, and notably was Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, I believe William Foster. And so that, I believe that had a, something of an influence in the Communist Party. And also, um, we have to notice a split between communists and anarchists, which has existed since the beginning of the First International with the conflict between Marx and um, Kropotkin. Uh, but it also has even a contemporary influence because in the 60s, I belonged to a union that had no paid officials, we supported no one for uh, political office. We were not members of the AFL-CIO. In fact, the AFL-CIO didn't like us. And basically we had no, the idea of no paid officials and workers who could initiate uh, grievances on their own without any official approval. Uh, we really turned the welfare department upside down with that for a very long time. In fact, for one year, they were scared to death of firing anyone. So uh, I think anarchism has an influence and it's wonderful to notice uh, the significance of France uh, upon Great Britain and the anarchist movement as a whole throughout the world. Okay, thanks, Herbert. I mean, that does open up a much wider debate, which we may not have time for. 
for Constance, do you want to comment? No, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the very fact that we are discussing anarchism at the Socialist uh, History Society meeting does demonstrate that we have a pluralist uh, view of the different forms of socialism. Okay, um, there's also um, Tony Greenstein put in a comment about um, Rudolf Rocker. Do you want to say anything on that? No, sorry, I, I do again apologize for sort of sidelining that history. There's much to say that it, it was quite, Rocker was part of these international circles. I've mentioned this very international elite. Um, so Rocker was a part of it with Sol Yanovsky, for instance, and William Bass. And, uh, and of course, there is a, a very important tradition of organization in the East End, but I, I always treat it quite separately, and I do apologize because it's a, there's probably scope to write a more entangled history, but it doesn't quite jump at you, let's say, from the archives and the periodicals. Okay, uh, David Morgan's questioned whether William Crane really, sorry, Walter Crane, sorry, really um, designed the prospectus and saying, is it an imitation because it's quite crude? My reaction was, I think it is Walter Crane. It is, if it is an imitation, it's an extremely good imitation. Um, but Constance, any comment on that? I think Martin will know. I do apologize. I thought I should have. Um, yeah, I think Martin will know. Okay, I'm sure Martin thinks it's genuine. I was just about to type a reply into the <laughs> chat saying that it, it, it is definitely genuine because um, Walter Crane incl includes a reproduction of it in his own autobiography. That's and correct. I thought I'd seen it somewhere. Uh, he he, um, he, he all, also donated a large number of his own, own books that he wrote and illustrated to the school when it opened. And uh, William Morris paid for the printing of the prospectus of Louise Michel's school. So, you know, it definitely was a genuine, genuine Walter Crane cover. I think that provenance sounds very sound to me. I'm just interested, Martin, have you written more on the school that we can... That well, um, I, I have written something that's not been published okay. yet. Um, I keep wanting to update it with one or two bits and pieces I'm still trying to root out, but uh, I shall have to bite the bullet and uh, publish it with, with sort of a few gaps in the, in the record, but... Um, it, it's certainly quite an interesting little story. What, one question which it ha has thrown up is that um, Coulomb, the sp spy who was secretary at Louise Michel's school, who engineered the Walsall bomb plot, he was actually very active in Northern Ireland before he went to France and then came back to England. And I've often wondered, although there's no um, evidence to suggest it, I've wondered if he was actually uh, a Home Office spy in Northern Ireland already because he was in, involved in the Socialist League in Northern Ireland. And um, he, he also, um, it, it was the time when uh, Anderson was Home Secretary and he, he was particularly keen on infiltrating um, putting infiltrators into the Irish Republican movement. And I've often thought that uh, Coulomb had the perfect background for that. And um, that's what, how and why he got chosen to be, be um, uh, involved in spying in, in this country. Thanks, that sounds like it's worth some further research. I see there's a comment uh, in the chat that Coulomb was also in Dublin. Uh, okay, Tony Greenstein, you want to come back on Yes, just uh, very briefly, a, a good book on the anarchists in the East End and the work with uh, the Jewish workers, Rudolf Rocker, is William Fishman's East End Radicals, uh, which I'm sure Constance has heard of, uh, and it is well worth paying a visit. <laughs> wasn't, wasn't Jewish himself, could be said to have been the leader of that great tailor strike in uh, 1912, which ended in total victory. And indeed, uh, when they had won, he made this famous speech to thousands of Jewish workers, uh, recommending, urging that they continue to stay out until they had achieved a closed shop, which is exactly what they did. And if you imagine that these tailors' workshops 
were often just employing a few Jewish workers. I mean, there weren't, uh, there weren't mass production facilities. It was a remarkable victory. And then the extension by the workers of a hand to the dockers who were being starved into submission in a sense in the East End really laid the basis for the anti-fascist unity of the 1930s when you saw Catholic dockers and bearded Jewish Orthodox Jews and so on standing shoulder to shoulder against the attempted incursion of the Mosleyites into the East End. So it's an incredibly important era. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. I certainly recommend the William Fishman book. It's, it's brilliant. OK, um, last questions now, last chance. Um, Steve Cushion. Uh, just to say the other thing that uh, 12 years ago, the Socialist History Society published a, uh, a history of the Jewish Bakers Union called Union Bread. It's been out of print for a long time. Uh, today, I put a PDF of it on the website uh, uh, so that you're welcome to have a look at it. I think it's uh, uh, really interesting and it fits in uh, uh, quite a lot of detail with uh, 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 some of the stuff that uh, Constance, uh, of which Constance has spoken today. So uh, uh, you're welcome to it. Uh, thanks for plugging that. A coincidence that we've just gone on the website today, having been rediscovered in the archive. Um, OK, anybody else? Uh, can't see anybody else. So Constance, do you want to say a few final words? No, just um, thank you for such a stimulating discussion. And that was great. That's such an interesting topic. And, uh, it was great. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much to you and do go out and buy the book.